Well, hello, it's Bruce Williams again, and it's time for part six of my series on the selected gross pathology of the rabbits. As I do at the beginning of all of my lectures, I want to thank those colleagues and friends who provided me their images over the years, which allow me to put these lectures together. We're going to cover a couple of systems in this particular lecture, so let's start with the musculoskeletal system. This is a classic and common problem in laboratory rabbits, especially heavy rabbits. They may sit with their legs straight out, they may dog sit, but they can't move their back legs because they've broken their back. The rabbit's not put together all that well, and the rabbit skeleton is only 8% of its body weight, and its muscles almost 50%. So if unsupported, a good leg kick will fracture the vertebra in the lumbar spine. Here's another rabbit who is dog sitting, and you can see that there's urine under them because the animal's incontinence as a result of damage to the nerves that supply the detrusor muscle. And here's the spot where it always happens. A good kick with unsupported hind end is going to cause a break at L7. And an older picture which demonstrates the fractured vertebra and the hemorrhage into the psoas muscle associated with this type of traumatic injury. This is how you carry a big bunny, and this is a big bunny, making sure that you support the hind end and that you rein in those large black back legs. Another thing that this will prevent that rabbit from is scraping you with its nails when it kicks and tries to get away and leaves some rather large rake marks across your abdomen. So make sure that you carry rabbits very carefully. Here's another condition in rabbits that over the years has sort of been all lumped together under the term splay leg. But splay leg really isn't a single condition in rabbits, but results for a number of genetic defects. These young rabbits generally cannot adduct the hind legs uh, and stand, and the condition may be due to hypoplastic development of the pelvis with femoral luxation. It can be due to a distal foreleg curvature, so the animal can't bring in its forelegs, and occasionally is due to spinal defects, spinal cord defects, including syringomyelia. Here's a poorly developed pelvis in the rabbit, and the femoral heads will easily pop out. It's a little bit like a hip dysplasia in dogs. Here's an absolutely fantastic lesion, and I took this picture out of veterinary pathology about 10 years ago. I wish they had done this in color, but the lesion is so great, I don't want to leave it out. The paper talked about growing rabbits from two rabbit trees, which were fed with commercial concentrates and hay, which developed painful thickenings of the extremities. There's tremendous periosteal new growth of the extremities, the metacarpals, metatarsals, the tarsal and carpal bones, and the mandibles. Analysis of the bones in these animals showed 25 to 30 times the amount of fluoride in the bone. And this lesion is very similar to what you see in ruminants who are exposed to toxic levels of fluoride. Fluoride uh, is very similar to calcium from the body's point of view, and the body will incorporate fluoride into the bones and the teeth in place of calcium, especially calcium within the hydroxyapatite crystals. These bones become very brittle, and a lot of periosteal bone is put down to try and reinforce them. Something that was very different in these rabbits than in cattle was this proliferative gastritis. There was a tremendous uh, proliferation of the mucus cells in the stomach. It never really tied in as to whether it might be due to the fluoride or a secondary disease. But if the two go together, that's an amazing lesion to see in these animals. Okay, 
Here's a bunny rabbit who has been drooling. The ears are drawn back. The eyes are wide open. The head is back over and all four limbs are extended. This is a classic case of tetanus, which we can see in any mammalian species. Clostridium tetani produces a toxin known as tetanospasm, causes inhibition of Renshaw cells, which are the cells that prevent our lower motor neurons who are always wanting to fire from always firing without the protection of the Renshaw cells, which are inactivated by Clostridium tetani. Then animals go into this sort of anti-mortem rigor um, with extension of all of the muscles. Here's a terrible picture. Um, and these next three pictures are from my friend uh, Tim Cooper, who's a fantastic lecturer and always gives these rabbit lectures over the last five or six years at all of our polo courses in the US and Europe. And he has some great pictures. And this is an example of someone who did a very poor job in hind leg inoculation and inoculated into or in the close proximity of the sciatic nerve. With inoculations in rabbit, the lumbar muscles are generally preferred. And generally, you don't give more than a cc of anything into the muscles. If you have more than that, and it's not a particularly gigantic rabbit, you want to split it into multiple sections. Okay. You can inject into the caudal muscle mass of the hind leg, but you have to take extreme care and palpate all of the muscles, including the semitendinosus, the biceps femoris, semimembranous, to know exactly where you're going because it can be absolutely disastrous to get uh, anything around the, uh, around the sciatic nerve. There have been a number of cases of self mutilization uh, resulting from injection of xylazine along with other anesthetic agents and they may, may be fairly mild something like this and you say well he has uh, chewed off his toe um, that doesn't seem fairly mild when when you compare it to something like this which is the result of injection into the sciatic nerve and they can't feel it so uh, it's not like it's extremely painful when they're chewing it off that nerve is dead everything underneath it is going to gone denervation so just be really, really careful with uh, doing any injections into the hind legs of rabbits. Best to find another spot. Okay, let's look at the nervous system, which will include the, uh, the eyes in this particular lecture. And we're looking at a bunny with its head tilted to the side. This is known as torticollis, and it indicates that there is either disease of the brain, which is most likely, or disease of the inner ear. Not the middle ear, but the inner ear. In a 2009 paper, in a study of neurologic disease in 120 rabbits, a causative agent was identified in about 70% of cases, and in over 60%, it was the microsporidian parasite encephalidozoan cuniculi. Cephalidozoan will affect a range of mammals, especially the rabbit and the dog, but it also affects non-human primates and humans. Uh, dogs and monkeys tend to have more clinical signs than rabbits, but you get some excellent lesions in rabbits as well. It is a parasite that uh, chooses to infect primarily the brain and the kidney, and it is spread uh, through the urine. When I first started in pathology uh, back in the 1980s, we would see this all the time in laboratory rabbits. Um, I haven't seen it in years uh, in laboratory rabbits. However, a lot of pet rabbits have it. You can see chronic lesions, which we'll see in our next lecture in the, uh, uh, in the kidneys. The lesion in the brain generally is very histologically profound, but doesn't result in any gross lesions. There's clinical signs if it's bad enough. The vast majority of these uh, infections are incidental findings that you will see upon histologic review of tissues taken at necropsy. 
this microsporidian is spread in the urine, but it is ingested or inhaled, and it takes about three months to develop brain lesions. This is an old picture I took a number of years ago, and you can see these are the classic lesions. They are granulomas within the brain. And if you look around these areas, or, or in unaffected areas of the brain, you will see the microsporidian cysts. You have to look fairly carefully. This means that they have ruptured. They will sit in the parenchyma um, in an unruptured state, be perfectly fine. Once they rupture, then the body recognizes parasite, and you'll have granulomas inflammation, which will eventually result in a much smaller glial scar. Note the overlying meningitis as well. And this is what a microsporidian cyst looks like. These are spores. You can pick them up a little easier on gram stains because they stain strongly gram positive. So if you're short for time, make sure that you get uh, gram stains on your rabbit brains and they'll pop right out at you. You can most often find inflammation and cysts within the uh, cerebrum. Occasionally you'll see them in the cerebellum as well. The presence of these cysts often do not correlate well with the uh, severity of clinical signs. So some animals have lots of cysts and inflammation with no clinical signs, and some you only have a little bit of inflammation, and their head's basically turned upside down. Dwarf rabbits um, have a very interesting syndrome associated with encephalodizone. Of course, they can have the... Uh, the cerebral and, and kidney lesion, but but uh, they're well known for uh, having cataracts as a result of infection in utero with encephalitazone cuniculi during the phase in which the optic cup is developing. If the mother is infected, the organisms can cross the placenta. And for some reason, they hone in on the developing lens within the optic cup. And they will position themselves. Well, they'll sit there for months, if not longer, by causing no sign. And the eye and the, the lens is formed around them. Over time, they will begin to proliferate. The animal will begin to liquefy the lens. And then the animal will develop a cataract and ultimately, phacolytic uveitis. Okay, here's another torticollis bunny. We have to think about the other things that, that may cause it. Certainly, top of our list, um, and we've already been through this in other lectures, but top of our list is going to be Pastorella multocida, or snuffles commonly affects the middle and inner ear, or can cause a suppurative meningitis. Either of those can be enough to cause neurologic changes in the bunny. Um, as far as tumors, rabbits do get some brain tumors, and they do get lymphoma um, in the brain. So I would not absolutely rule that one out. And then one other possibility for uh, an animal that is either kept outside or ranges outside, especially uh, in the area that raccoons will frequent is the presence of Bayless ascaris. We've seen this a number of times at the JPC, especially in wild rabbits. This is a form of visceral larval migraines that affects a large range of bird species and mammalian species who get into raccoon feces. Raccoons tend to be latrine animals. They will pick out an area under the eaves of the roof um, where birds can get into it, or they often will defecate in the uh, between the roots of a particular tree. And you'll get a lot of feces in there. The, the eggs of Bayless ascaris, like other ascaris, are incredibly hardy. They hang around for a long time. And if they are ingested by a rabbit that comes by, even in the absence of the feces, which were there months ago, and sort of grazes and nibbles the grass there, they can pick up 
the egg of this particular ascarid. And Bayless ascaris procyonis is well known for the incidence of visceral larval migraines, especially to the brain in certain species. And unlike, uh, unlike many other species, these uh, roundworms tend to grow and migrate at the same time, leaving large tracks within the brain and other organs. I've seen them in a wide range of organs, including kidney and lung and liver and spleen. And uh, um, they can be absolutely devastating even to human children. So not a good idea to keep raccoons around the house to feed them or anything like that because this is a potential complication for family members, for pets, uh, etc. Another potential cause of torticollis and neurologic disease resulting from encephalitis, the threat is from the human owner. Here's somebody with a cold sore and rabbits, uh, especially pet rabbits, are very susceptible to infection with herpes simplex type 1. And we know from a number of uh, animal species that uh, when herpes viruses cross species lines, they often will cause a devastating encephalitis. And this is not an uncommon finding in pet rabbits. So be very careful. Um, especially if any of the family members are infected with, with herpes simplex 1 and get these cold sores that they stay away from the rabbit during that uh, particular time. Or, or maybe a pet rabbit um, or a pet monkey is not a good choice for somebody that has these frequent cold sores. Remember, the virus may be transmitted in advance of visible signs during the prodrome. New World monkeys are ex also extremely susceptible to herpes simplex 1 infection. Okay, just a little bit about the eye. Um, this, we can see here that the, the eye is enlarged, the cornea is somewhat bluish, and this is a New Zealand white with uh, congenital bufthalmia. There are uh, strains of these animals which are bred to study uh, glaucoma, um, the BU gene, they're homozygous for the BU gene, so they, I guess they're boo-boo uh, rabbits, but they're all New Zealand uh, whites, and the lesions are primarily seen in the, uh, the first six months with uh, uh, the underdevelopment of the outflow channels within the anterior chamber. Um, so drainage is extremely poor, and due to the extensibility of the sclera in these animals at this age, there's little evident discomfort. Obviously, there is going to be discomfort in these animals because the outflow channels are underdeveloped, don't generally respond to anti-glaucoma therapy. Um, it is an autosomal recessive disease. It has incomplete penetrance, um, so some homozygotes may show no disease. What, what that essentially means is if you have one allele for this, you probably won't show disease. If you have both, um, you would show disease, but if it has incomplete penetrance, maybe only 60 or 70 percent will actually show disease, and you'll have a, a subset of animals um, who are homozygous alleles on both sides, but don't show any disease. That's incomplete penetrance, or at least to my limited knowledge of genetics. And our last lecture is another picture from a, a recent publication from Dr. Tim Cooper in veterinary ophthalmology in 2015. And, and I'm just going to use this to illustrate and talk a little bit about cataracts in rabbits. Um, rabbits will get cataracts like any other species. There have been a number of studies in, in outbred New Zealand whites and, and some inbred lines which show the incidence uh, in older animals to be somewhere between 3 and 4%. Um, remember, we talked about the encephalitisone cuniculi that does it in dwarf rabbits. This does not appear to be much of a problem in, uh, in other strains of rabbits. Uh, Dr. Cooper was working with a, uh, a congenic strain of rabbits, and they were able to increase the incidence considerably up to uh, uh, even 33% uh, in these by 
continually inbreeding a strain of congenic New Zealand white rabbits. So, you know, they took affected rabbits, they inbred them even more, they increased the incidence so they could study the genetics and the, uh, the pathophysiology of this particular problem. So there's not a great spontaneous rabbit model, but this shows that you can really increase the uh, incidence of something with appropriate inbreeding. So, I think that that covers everything in, uh, at least that I have in musculoskeletal and nervous. We're going to have one more lecture in this series. Lecture 7 is going to cover the urinary, respiratory, and the, uh, uh, what's left? The endocrine system. So I hope you come back for that. I hope you've enjoyed this little 20-minute lecture. And uh, feel free to come to the Foundation's YouTube or Facebook page anytime. There's always something to talk about. Have a great day.